Okay, in our second session now, we're going to talk about uh, some specific uh, ideologies and how they impact thinking about the value of human life. And I've done a great deal of research in this particular topic about Darwinism. I, 2004, I put a book out called From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism uh, in Germany. And so I've done a lot of uh, research on the history of Darwinism and especially its moral and ethical implications. Uh, um, and Darwinism has contributed to our culture, our present, to what we call culture of death, some, some people refer to as. Uh, because even though Darwinism doesn't logically entail uh, support for abortion or euthanasia, there are many elements within Darwinian theory that do contribute to uh, a culture of death. And if you look historically, and of course I'm a historian, so if you look historically, many thinkers have advanced Darwinian arguments to support abortion and euthanasia. And so as a historian, I'm not sort of claiming that I'm not looking at Darwinism and trying to say it logically entails these particular things. And in fact, I'm actually, what I'm actually doing is looking at Darwinian thinkers themselves and looking at how they justified their views of abortion and euthanasia and such. Uh, and uh, it's pretty remarkable uh, how this worked itself out. In fact, the, uh, Ian Dalbigan, who's written the, the best uh, historical work on the history of the euthanasia movement in the United States, uh, going back to the uh, 1860s and 1870s, uh, argues that the coming to Darwinism in America was one of the most pivotal moments in euthanasia, the beginnings of the euthanasia uh, movement. So uh, we see this in a lot of other places too. Richard Dawkins has claimed that the pro-life position is deeply unevolutionary. That's his term for pro-life position. It's deeply unevolutionary. And he claims that Darwinism provides a sanction then for abortion and euthanasia. And he's not alone. There's many other uh, thinkers that uh, have uh, argued that particular thing. So let's take a step back and look at what are the features then of Darwinian theory that have contributed uh, to this undermining of the value of human life. Well, first of all, I would argue that uh, Darwinism, well, it's not that I would argue. Darwinism does reject teleology, and I'd argue that that rejection of teleology, and that just means having purpose or meaning or plan, something being planned out, that that notion of there not being purpose in the history of living organisms does have a profound impact on the way that we view uh, human life. Uh, Darwinism claims that we are the product of millions of accidents, you know, mute, random mutations. They're copying mistakes. So we're the result of just millions of mistakes that have happened over time. So I suppose that makes us a colossal mistake. Uh, Dawkin, Richard Dawkins has stated, for example, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Okay, so that's the view of uh, humanity, there's no design, there's no purpose, no good or evil, so no morality, no objective morality, and so nothing but pitiless indifference. So this notion of there not being purpose uh, uh, strips humanity of meaning and moral significance in a very strong way. A second key feature is the notion that flows out of Darwinism that humans are nothing more than animals. Now, of course, you can believe in Darwinism and still believe that, okay, there's something, that, you know, there could be something more to animals. But certainly if you look at Darwin himself, Darwin was interested in trying to bring humans as close to animals as possible because his, his, he was trying to show that there's no significant difference between species. And so he, has to, he believes he needs to do that with humans uh, as well. And so Darwin argued that humans are not qualitatively different than animals. Now he recognized, of course, we're different. Uh, but he argues those differences are just quantitative, that we just have a little more rationality, a little more social instinct, a little more aesthetic sense than other animals, other organisms. But qualitatively, he didn't see there any, being any significant difference. And certainly most of Darwin's followers uh, were likewise going to make similar kind of arguments. Here's a slide showing you Ernst Haeckel, the leading German Darwinist in the late 19th century. Uh, a, this is from a 1911 edition of his book, Natürliche Schöpfungsgeschichte, uh, where we have this painting that was given to him of, what's, uh, of what 
is supposed to be a missing link. Uh, this is not really, a, it's just an imaginary painting of something that could have been a missing link. It's not actually a, a painting of anything that has any reality behind it. It's totally imaginative. But you get the idea that, you know, because humans have uh, evolved gradually from uh, ape ancestors, ape-like ancestors, therefore, you know, humans are not substantively different than them. I mean, at what point would there be a difference? You know, there's supposed to be very gradual gradations in between these uh, changes going on in the evolutionary scale. So uh, the notion then is that humans are not all that different. And Peter Singer, uh, in his book Unsanctifying Human Life, makes similar kinds of uh, no, uh, claims about humans not being significantly different from animals, where he talked about Singer a little bit. Uh, but uh, Singer said at one point uh, in relation to Darwinism, uh, he said that Darwin, quote, gave what ought to have been its final blow to the sanctity of life ethic. So Singer recognizes that his view that of human life and of humans not being all that uh, more important than other animals is built upon Darwinian foundations. And he argues that quite forthrightly in a number of places. He doesn't really hammer on it a lot. I mean, it isn't, it's not a, a major theme with him. Uh, but interestingly, uh, one of his colleagues, James Rachels, whose ideas are very similar to Singer's, and they knew each other, uh, James Rachels in the early 1990s published a book called Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism. And in that book, uh, he argues, he's a philosopher, and in that book he argues that Darwinism uh, undermines the sanctity of life ethic. But he thinks that's a good thing, and then he uses that to argue that because Darwinism undermines the Judeo-Christian sanctity of life ethic, he argues, then that makes abortion infanticide and euthanasia morally permissible. So that's basically uh, his argument. A third key feature of Darwinian theory that was going to undermine the value of human life is the idea that morality is a biologically determined trait. So Darwin believed that morality was largely grew out of what he called social instincts that had developed in through the uh, natural selection. Uh, and because of that, uh, if morality is just a, a biologically determined trait, this implies that there's no objective morality. The morality changes over time. It's it, it may be specific to particular species. Certain species may have some social instincts that others don't have, and, and vice versa. In fact, I was at a, a conference back in 2009 under the 150th anniversary of Darwin's Origin of Species, uh, and one of the speakers there uh, was talking about how black widows, the female, uh, devours the male after uh, they procreate. And uh, he remarked that it's just a flip of the coin, he said, that we're not like that. And he said, if we were like that, then he said all of our morality, all of our religious systems would incorporate that and revolve around that uh, right if, if females ate males after they uh, ha reproduced. So uh, it's just a, a chance event what kind of morality we have at this point. There's, there's no real... Uh, objectivity to morality then in this particular view. And Darwin in his uh, autobiography uh, did uh, state and, and made clear that he understood this. He said, uh, one can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, uh, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. Now, Darwin, being the good Victorian that he was, thought that the best and strongest instincts were the golden rule, and he says this explicitly. Uh, however, this doesn't really give him any uh, moral fulcrum to criticize those that might think that their instincts lead them in different directions. You know, Genghis Khan said that he delighted in uh, exterminating his enemies, raping their wives, and pillaging their cities. Uh, that's what his instincts told him. You know, what did Hitler's instincts tell him? You know, well. Darwin would say, well, maybe they're aberrations or something. Again, he, he was a very kindly, Darwin was a very kindly person who uh, believed in love your neighbor as yourself, uh, but he still recognized that you're just following impulses and instincts, uh, and they can be different from one place to another. And by the way, in his in, uh, De Descent of Man, he does actually talk about how he thinks certain races have different moral characteristics. And so he thought that morality could differ from race to race within the human even the, within the human species. 
Now, this idea is, uh, had become very uh, prominent in the late 20th century through the rise of so-called sociobiology and evolutionary psychology. Uh, and E.O. Wilson, who's the leading figure in helping to establish sociobiology as a discipline in the 1970s, he's a professor at Harvard University, uh, his specialty is ants, entomology. He and Michael Ruse, Michael Ruse is a prominent philosopher of science, uh, in 1985 article said, ethics as we understand it uh, is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. Okay, so morality is just an illusion. There's nothing objective about it. There's nothing out there telling you to do things. It's just your feelings inside you, instincts that have been bred into you through the Darwinian processes, through biological processes. So this is then, this then uh, uh, relativizes morality, which, ha which I would argue has very uh, negative consequences on our view of the value of human life. A fourth key feature of Darwinian theory is human inequality. Now this isn't right as pronounced today among our Darwinian biologists, but in the late 19th and early 20th centuries it was very pronounced. Uh, and I already mentioned to you about Darwin's own views about races having different moral characteristics. He also thought they had different intellectual characteristics uh, and such. Uh, evolution requires variation. And it requires variation within the human species as well. And so there are many people who drew the conclusion from that that therefore uh, human different human lives have different amounts of value. In fact, Darwin himself uh, certainly implied that uh, in many ways. And certainly in his, his talk about races, he talked about higher races and lower races. And there's a whole section in Descent to Man on the extermination of races, which, by the way, Darwin saw going on with the Tasmanians, the Australian Aborigines, the North American uh, Native Americans. <clears throat> So he saw this going on. He saw the Europeans going out and wiping out other peoples. And he saw this as part of the Darwinian struggle for existence, as did many other Darwinian thinkers coming behind him there. There were also many people then that were going to build upon this idea of seeing certain individuals as being superior and inferior because of this inequality within humanity. In fact, there were actually a lot of people, and I quote some of these in my book from Darwin to Hitler, who were actually arguing forthrightly that, that, hum that, that human equality was just ridiculous because Darwinism shows that humans aren't equal. You know, there's variation out there. And in the late 19th century, a movement was going to arise called the eugenics movement, which was a movement to try to uh, improve human heredity that was based upon Darwinian principles. And one of the things that they believed in the uh, eugenics movement was that uh, Certain people are inferior to others, and so we need to try to restrict their reproduction so that we can improve human heredity and, and sort of promote the reproduction of those that are more fit. And they use this term fit and unfit quite a bit, actually, in a lot of the, the discourse, which come out of Darwinian thinking about fitness and, and unfitness. But here's a, a picture showing you uh, a, a German psychiatrist who was a follower of uh, Lombroso. Lombroso was actually the person who founded uh, this school of what's called criminal anthropology in the 19th century. And Lombroso wrote a book called The Born Criminal, which argued that criminality is ingrained biologically into uh, people. So uh, they saw criminals as having negative biological characteristics. And this particular one here, and, and Lombroso did the same thing in his books too, by the way, uh, but Corella uh, showed in this uh, diagram this Italian criminal, and he argues the sloping forehead shows that he has you know, he's closer to the apes uh, than most other people. Uh, and so he, he has these, these characteristics that are sort of throwback uh, to, other evolution, to earlier evolutionary stages. And that's what makes him a criminal because he has these animalistic tendencies and such. Uh, here's another shot. Uh, this is actually some Nazi propaganda. The Nazis were very strong uh, promoters of eugenics, uh, although, again, the, the, the eugenics movement was around long before the Nazi period, and the United States, had a, United States, Britain, other countries had very strong eugenics movements as well there. This one's called the threat of the subhuman, uh, and the idea here is that this is a, uh, a, uh, a male criminal, and he has lots of kids, and here's a criminal marriage, still has a good number of kids. Here you have an academic marriage, 1.9 kids, and so the idea here is that the wrong people are reproducing. You know, the, these people with these bad traits, these bad moral traits are reproducing, and the, the people, the, the average German family only has 2.2 children, uh, and so it isn't keeping up. And so the idea is to create fear that they're going to get swamped there, and that we need to do something about this. 
you know, so try to limit reproduction of those that are identified as either criminal or uh, mentally ill. It was not only done within wind society, though, also a scientific racism was going to look at inf the differences between humans. So here we have, this is Ernst Teckel, a leading German Darwinist, and there was actually a, uh, so you have f six different humans, human uh, races up here, you have six different simian species here, and the step between here and here, if you notice these, they look almost the same, except a little more hair on this one. Okay, and, and the caption to this was, the difference between the highest human, that's this one up here, the European, right? The difference between the highest human and the lowest human, that's down here, is greater than the difference between the lowest human and the highest ape. So the idea is that these guys are closer to each other than these are to each other. So that's how the differences were being run in many of the late 19th century in terms of the, the human inequality. That was going to have some pretty profound impacts for thinking about the value of human life. A fifth key characteristic, uh, the human struggle for existence. The human struggle for existence means that humans reproduce more prolifically than they can possibly uh, sustain, and so that means there's going to be necessary death and competition to the death. Uh, in, the death of, in the descent of man, Darwin stated, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. So this notion that humans are in this struggle for existence, and it's, a, it's an existence to the death. There's, people are going to die. There's going to be extermination of many people. Finally, death, and I think you see this in the quotation I just gave you, that death gets construed then as a positive force. It's what brings about evolutionary progress. So Darwin said in The Origin of Species, he said, quote, thus from the war of famine, I think I have this up here. Yeah, there we go. Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely, the production of the higher animals, directly follows. So this warfare, this extermination, is producing something good, according to uh, Darwin. And so this was going to lead a number of people in the period after Darwin to think that Maybe they should even kill people to help along the evolutionary prog prog process, rather. Since evolution already results in the death of multitudes, you know, if we see those that are inferior out there, maybe we should just kill the inferior off so that the superior can thrive. And this is the kind of, uh, although obviously most people aren't going to take it to this extreme, this is really the mentality that was driving uh, Nazism and was driving Hitler's own thinking. Uh, and I have a whole book out called Hitler's Ethic in which I discuss uh, how Hitler uh, believed that morality was defined by what uh, advances the human uh, species. Uh, Hitler uh, obviously was more radical than most, but here's his view of nature and humanity. This is a, a book, by the way, dedicated to Christmas. And this is the frontispiece of the book, and it's a quote from Hitler that says, all of nature is a violent struggle between power and weakness, an eternal victory of the strong over the weak. Not exactly peace on earth, goodwill toward men, you know, more typical kind of Christmas message, more traditional kind of Christmas message. And because of Hitler's view of this evolutionary struggle for existence and humans uh, necessarily killing each other off in various ways, uh, he began a compulsory sterilization program in 1933 to try to keep people with disabilities from reproducing. Then in 1939, he began a uh, program of killing people with disabilities. It resulted in 200,000 people with disabilities in Germany being killed, plus tens of thousands elsewhere. We don't even have a good statistics for how many were killed in Poland and uh, France and other places that were occupied by the Germans. But 200,000 Germans plus tens of thousands elsewhere were killed because they were disabled, and the Nazis uh, believed that this was a way of helping out evolution you know, by uh, killing them. Uh, and then, of course, the extermination of races was also part of the Nazi program of trying to improve the human species and help out uh, evolution. <clears throat> Ian Daubigan, I mentioned them before, in fact, here. Ian Daubigan, in his book, A Merciful End, The Euthanasia Movement in Modern America, states, quote, the most pivotal turning point in the early history of the euthanasia movement was the coming of Darwinism to America. So this wasn't just a Nazi thing. Darwinism had an impact in other countries too, 
in helping to make people think that euthanasia could be a good thing, helping out evolution uh, and such. And that's very often how they justified it uh, there uh, and such. Okay, so now in conclusion, it does seem to me that uh, Darwinism is partly responsible. Again, I don't want to, it, we don't want to overplay this. There's other secular ideologies, of course, that feed into the, the culture of death we have. But Darwinism is partly responsible and does uh, have some impact here. In fact, there's a recent sociological study by a professor at University of California, San Diego, uh, which confirms this. He wrote a book called What is a Human? What the Answers Mean? for human rights. This came out with Oxford University Press in, in 2016. And actually he was trying to counter views like mine uh, that argued that Darwinism uh, undermined the human rights and such. And so he did some surveys about human rights. And what he found was that lo and behold, those people who have what he calls a biological view of humanity, which basically is an evolutionary Darwinian view of humanity, he found out that they did have less respect for human rights than did those who held what he, upheld what he called a theological uh, view of humanity, which is basically a Judeo-Christian view that humans are created in the image of God. And so that's interesting, it was sort of powerful confirmation. Uh, and he himself is a secularist. He's not, he, you know, he was actually trying to counter these ideas. I think he came up with some results he uh, didn't uh, like. He actually tries later on to try to uh, explain away certain of, uh, elements of it, but he is very uh, uh, truthful in showing what his surveys actually said. So in my book, uh, Death of Humanity, uh, I discuss many other factors that deal with this undermining of human life. But so it's not, Darwin is not the sole factor, but it is really a, a, a powerful influence in bringing about the uh, culture of death that we see today.